Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Diana Coyle, and I am the Director of Education and Programs for the Association of Fraternity Sorority Advisors, and I will be serving as one of the moderators for today's webinar, along with my colleague, Scarlett. My name is Scarlett Winters, and I am the Online Engagement Specialist for Association of College Unions International, ACUI, and we are happy to be partnering with AFSA and American College Health Association to bring you today's webinar on COVID-19. We recognize that the COVID-19 pandemic is challenging across all fronts and a topic that we are discussing daily. Today, we will be sharing with you resources and guidelines that we hope will help you on your campuses and within your organizations. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide an update on the spread of COVID-19 and an overview of ACHA's new guidelines on COVID-19 and other resources that are being used to help guide campus actions. Before we begin, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items. Those registered will receive a link to the recording of today's presentation, and the recording will also be posted on the ACHA website tomorrow. We welcome you to submit questions at any time during the webinar using the question pane in your webinar control panel. We will save questions for the presenters to answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Let's begin. Our first presenter is James Jacobs of Stanford University. Jim, please introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Jacobs. I'm a physician on the faculty at Stanford. Um, I also have oversight for our student health services and uh, have a role in, in student affairs. I'm here today representing um, the ACHA's Emerging, Emerging Public Health Threats and Emergency Response Coalition um, and have um, been a member of the ACHA COVID-19 uh, Task Force. Um, it's a, a privilege to be participating uh, today and a true honor for me to be co-presenting with my uh, longtime friend and colleague, Sarah Van Orman. And I also uh, admire the ability of, of these uh, three professional organizations to come together uh, for this uh, webinar uh, today. Uh, if we have the uh, next slide, please. The, the title for my section is um, theory, but really what it is is a, is a brief um, uh, reminder about the why for what we as, as regions, communities, and particularly campuses are doing um, uh, in our effort to uh, respond to the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this really isn't theory, it's going to be very practical, but um, in the midst of uh, the uh, frantic activities that uh, almost all of us are involved in, it's, uh, I think it's helpful to step back and say, why are we continuing to push hand washing in the, uh, in the frame of uh, pandemic conditions? So I'm just going to very briefly um, uh, go through a little bit of the why. So um, I'm going to use this graphic uh, for, for my three slides, and I only have three slides. But uh, on the left-hand side of the graphic are some little dots representing virus particles. The official name for the virus is SARS-CoV-2, um, and the disease that it causes is called COVID-19. But I think for almost all of us, uh, we are uh, condensing all of this down to referring to COVID-19 um, and are virtually never making reference to the actual virus name. <clears throat> and so these virus particles um, are out there, and we believe uh, for the most part that the risk uh, comes in the form of respiratory tract um, um, exposure, but I'm gonna come back to that um, in a moment. So uh, my first major take home point is that the presence of virus in the environment does not necessarily mean um, an exposure, that uh, an exposure does not necessarily lead to infection, that infection does not necessarily lead to illness, um, and certainly, and especially amongst our young adult populations that we uh, focus on primarily in, in our um, co uh, collegiate worlds, um, illness does not translate uh, to severe illness most of the time. 
then having said that, um, going back, uh, you know, asymptomatic infection, so being infected with the virus but not having illness, I put a dashed line on the slide um, because it's just not clear um, completely, at least, whether asymptomatic infection can lead to uh, re-entry um, of, of virus into, um, into the community. Um, very controversial, uh, ongoing topic of, of um, research, but it is very clear that symptomatic persons, um, particularly through the forms of, of, of coughing, sneezing, um, will cause a uh, virus to be reinserted um, um, into, into the community. Also relevant is that even though, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is primarily considered to be a respiratory virus, very similar to the common cold, mono, uh, strep, um, many others that we could list, uh, especially uh, seasonal influenza. Um, there um, are still a lot of unknowns about the ability of the virus to live on surfaces and whether um, we can become um, infected or exposed through contact with an infected surface. And then uh, smoldering for the last few weeks and then heightened in the last 20 or four or 48 hours has been concern uh, about whether um, we can be infected um, through um, virus that shows up in fecal material, um, uh, sort of a, a fecal oral transmission route, exactly the same as we might consider for norovirus. So um, having laid this out, uh, and if I could have the next slide, please, Sarah. Um, I've listed here a few of the steps that I suspect that all of us, whether on our campuses, in our communities, or even in our own homes, are practicing, and which uh, listeners to this webinar may be sometimes challenged uh, to explain to, uh, to, to our various uh, constituents. So the, the first I've listed is enhanced cleaning. So uh, it seems intuitively uh, reasonable that in the, in the face of, of um, germs that we would do enhanced cleaning. But you know, the, where this falls into the spectrum is the more um, effective our cleaning techniques, the less virus that will be in the environment, and therefore the less the chance of exposure uh, to virus. The techniques for doing that enhanced cleaning, again, is a source of ongoing um, conversation, but good old soap and water um, cleaning seems to be um, a great first step, although the requirements certainly are going to be different, potentially in a healthcare setting or a daycare setting. Um, second, I've listed hand washing, and I'm sure that the whole world is tired of being told to wash its hands, but the importance cannot be uh, um, overstated. Uh, the, the, the concern is that if I've coughed into my hand, or I've touched an infectious, uh, infected surface, um, again, very similar to, to norovirus, I have risk both of infecting myself by uh, touching my respiratory tract, which for the case of uh, a coronavirus includes the, uh, the conjunctiva of the eye, the lining of the, of the eyeball, um, my nose and my mouth. And so if my hands, um, are transmitting virus, I'm a risk to myself, but I'm also a risk to others. So I touch a keyboard um, with my dirty hands, the next person comes along and touches that keyboard or doorknob uh, and potentially, again, can infect, in, infect themselves through, um, uh, uh, through, this, through this transmission from a surface uh, uh, to, uh, to my respiratory tract. Uh, cough etiquette, that's mostly about protecting other people. If I'm symptomatic, whether it be with COVID or with another respiratory tract um, uh, condition right now, uh, it is so reassuring to see folks that are practicing appropriate cough and sneeze etiquette. Because um, that's uh, keeping the, the load of virus down in, uh, in, the, in the area in which uh, I'm uh, standing. 
which then again limits the potential to expose other people. I mentioned uh, non-face touching. Uh, that again probably starts to seem silly to uh, folks in the face of pandemic, but because this is a respiratory virus and because it uh, can um, uh, be transmitted uh, uh, from a, uh, an infected um, hand uh, to my respiratory tract through rubbing my eyes, picking my nose, or sucking on my fingernails, um, the importance of keeping um, our dirty hands away from our face is critical. And then, of course, the, the single largest effort uh, worldwide towards uh, decreasing exposure and then the, with the theoretical decreased potential for infection is social distancing. Um, the, the further away I am from other people, the less likely it is that um, I can be infected or that if I'm infected, that I will infect them. Um, we're using six feet as a semi-definition of social distancing, but uh, how this is playing out around the world um, uh, um, you know, varies from circumstance to circumstance. In the county um, in which Stanford is located, um, we're actually um, on a, uh, um, oh, sorry, I'm blanking on the name. It's not a stay at home, it's a uh, shelter in place. Um, our, and our entire county is on, on shelter in place. Um, except for, of course, healthcare workers and, and uh, other first responders. Uh, and so again, the purpose of the shelter in place and all of the restrictions on group gatherings that we're seeing that um, have major effect on our, on our college campuses is to help force the issue of social distancing. And then finally, uh, I know that some folks have been just outrightly irritated that we continue to push flu shots. And frankly, as we go a couple more weeks um, into this, uh, flu shots will be increasingly less relevant. Um, but even though a flu shot has absolutely nothing to do with uh, protecting against infection from, from uh, coronavirus, um, certainly one of the epidemiological uh, findings so far has been that um, sick people are going to be more vulnerable to uh, bad effects of COVID than non-sick people. Uh, and so by staying, by having one more uh, uh, technique for helping me to stay um, healthy, it is going to decrease my risk for uh, significant illness from um, COVID. But also the fewer people we have running around campus with flu-like illnesses, the less confusion there is with regards to the presence of, of COVID. And Sarah, if I could have my last slide, please. And having gone through all of this, um, it's really important in this slide now, or this, this, this graphic has now been shown um, widely in, in recent weeks. It's a CDC um, drawing. The goal of most of what we're doing is not to keep me from being sick. Most of it is to keep me and Sarah from being sick at the same time because the healthcare system simply can't uh, uh, respond to having a large part of the population uh, um, ill at the same time. So the purple um, curve shows the undesirable outcome where uh, the duration of the pandemic is is, is relatively short, um, but lots of the population is sick at the same time. And that's compared to the, uh, the more shallow um, hashed curve where the duration um, of the pandemic is, is prolonged, but we are able through cleaning and hand washing and cough etiquette and social distancing and so forth to, to keep the, the number of persons ill, particularly those requiring um, hospitalization and intensive care services, we're able to keep that number um, as low as possible um, in order to keep from breaking the, the uh, healthcare system. So uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'll turn it back to Scarlett. Thank you, Jim, for that valuable information. Again, we welcome you to submit questions at any time during the webinar using the questions pane in your webinar control panel. We will save questions for the presenters and answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Our second presenter is Sarah Van Orman of the University of Southern California. Sarah, please introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to join you here today um, and to uh, join my esteemed college 
co colleague Jim um, from Stanford University. Um, I um, have, like Jim, have also had the opportunity to lead uh, a, a student health service um, and a the campus efforts during this emerging pandemic. Um, I also had the opportunity to serve on the American College Health Association COVID-19 Task Force. Um, and what I want to do today is just to provide some highlights from the guidelines that we developed, um, particularly as it re relates uh, to campus facilities um, that I know many of you um, uh, represent or associated organizations uh, such as our fraternity and sorority life units. Um, and just thinking about uh, where each of you could think about these guidelines um, and how they might be applying to the work that you're looking at over the coming days to weeks. So one of the things that I think is important uh, to uh, be aware of is uh, some, just what are some of the operational issues that we touch on in the guidelines. And I'll hit some of these at the, at the um, high level, and then I know we'll want to make sure that we save quite a bit of time for questions. So as we move along in this, um, one of the things I'll acknowledge is that we are in very different places at di very different um, points in our country right now. So the strategy when we are um, doing as um, Jim mentioned to kind of helping to kind of you know slow the spread of cases, um, there's really two phases to the strategy. The first phase is identifying cases. Um, so uh, finding people who are sick, who might be infected and containing those people. So early identification and helping those people um, isolate themselves. Um, and that's really when we think about the early phases of it, that's when we were in, we were, you know, working, focusing on returning travelers, screening people who were travelers, screening people who were at high risk. We're still doing those activities, but we also know that we have many um, uh, communities where we have what's called community transmission. And the notion of community transmission is really critical. Community transmission means that we're seeing patients um, that are testing positive who have the illness where we don't know where they got it from. Um, they're not a returning traveler from an area that was at high risk. They're not someone who's had direct contact uh, with somebody else. So when we have community transmission, we know that there is there is lot likely uh, because of the factors Jim mentioned, many people in the community that have it, um, and they may be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. When we have community transmission. We, that's when we move quickly into uh, the community-wide measures of social distancing. So the assumption then starts to be that um, there's lots of, it's, it, it, there's infections um, out there in the community and we wanna look at how we're all moving, working, learning, living um, to minimize spread within our communities. So the areas we touch under operations, the first piece of this is situational awareness. Um, Jim is located in one of the areas of the country that actually probably has some of the most community transmission happening. Um, we also know that uh, there was an early situation in the Seattle area in New York. What universities and organizations may be doing in those communities looks very different than what they someone might be doing if they're in a smaller community um, where there's not yet uh, community transmission. That being said, uh, what we're seeing with this situation is very rapid development. So if you are don't have community transmission in your community right now, each of us needs to be ready um, for that to be present, um, if not today, uh, then tomorrow. So that situational awareness, making sure that you're connected to uh, health leadership at your campus, at your local public health department, to truly understand what is the situation in your community. The second issue uh, that is really highlighted uh, within our guidelines is related to 
the uh, first part of our strategy, which is identifying people who might be infected or exposed and support for them isolating. Our current recommendations are when someone is ill uh, with COVID-19 um, or is has an exposure uh, to someone with COVID-19 or is returning from certain countries, that they undergo a period of 14 days of self-isolation. Um, in the case when people are ill, there's other criteria that they have to, that we might apply to make sure they're no longer infectious. So as a campus, uh, we want to make sure we have processes for what would our role be um, in providing support for that individual, particularly if it's someone who may be uh, living with us um, or living living in a congregate living situation um, where it, it's difficult for them to self-isolate. The other uh, major area of planning has to do with events. We know that there have been a range of guidelines put out, including actually some federal guidance um, asking people to uh, limit the size of events. In the case of some uh, communities, um, such as um, Los Angeles, actually County now, uh, uh, Santa Clara County, that's come down to where, um, you know, for example, in my community, um, all restaurants are now closed. So on your campuses, um, really understanding uh, what are the places where people are coming together and um, how are you either shutting down um, those kinds of uh, events now so that you don't have people gathering in uh, large groups or restructuring them so that people can maintain a social, social distance so they can maintain six feet apart. Um, also, there are guidelines being developed for food service um, so that we're switching from dining in, from buffets to carry out. Each of you should be working um, in the areas of your environmental health, making sure that whoever is doing uh, facilities cleaning for you has the latest access to guidelines, uh, that you've increased the frequency of cleaning within your areas, and that you have provided uh, anyone who is doing those services um, that they have up-to-date uh, personal protective equipment and they understand um, what they may need to be doing to provide that cleaning activity safely. Um, it's important uh, that each of you uh, has evaluated your employees. Um, when we move to social distancing, our goal is to have individuals limit the number of people that are coming to our campuses each day to just those people that are really essential. Um, and by essential, meaning they're providing services that are necessary uh, for health, safety, uh, and other essential services. Um, we know that we will need to have our campuses, um, some people talk about the idea of campuses closing. Um, our camp, most of our campuses never close. We will continue to need to have uh, people here to care for people that are living with us, um, our other um, kind of uh, heat, light, all of those things. But the more people that can move to remote work, um, the better um, to limit the spread within the community. And then finally, most of our campuses need to be looking at our travel policies and plans. Um, both returning travelers as well as people traveling. Um, at, soon we're seeing across our country, we're moving to a strategy where people um, should limit their movements um, and limit their gathering. At this point, most campuses and most organizations uh, should have as a minimum a planning committee um, stood up that's preparing for these things. And in most cases, they should be moving into an emergency operations mode. Um, and that may be an emergency operations center at the campus level, but then also uh, an emergency management structure, even within your own organizations, so that you're prepared uh, for, the, for your, what may be happening in your community. A couple other items um, I'll mention within the guidelines that I would encourage you to pay attention to. One is the issues around um, how do you uh, 
communicate and provide leadership to your campus uh, to prevent issues of xenophobia from developing and make sure that the decisions that we make are supportive with our campus values. I encourage your campuses to have and your organizations to have a part of your planning process that particularly addresses the basic needs of students, uh, recognizing the financial impact that this may have and ensuring continuity of basic needs such as food and housing. Communications is very important. How are you communicating um, both within your organization um, and then also ensuring that your communications are aligned and consistent with communications that may be coming from the larger university as well as with, it, with best practices from the, your local uh, and state and federal public health. The last section of the guidelines to mention is business continuity planning. Business continuity planning is rooted in the essentials of identifying what critical services are and ensuring that they continue. In the case of a organization where you might provide housing to students and have um, obligations to continue to provide housing, um, how do you continue to do that, um, especially if the housing is congregate? Um, how do you continue to do that um, and ensure that you're able to do that um, if Many of you, we may have employees who are sick, um, who need to social distance, um, and in an environment where you, you may need to make sure that people are able to isolate um, and practice social distancing. The last side I'll talk about are some of the nuances of social distancing uh, that I think are worth calling out um, that many campuses are working on. Uh, the first is issues around remote work. Um, and um, understanding how you will, if you're going to continue some of your own operations, how do you allow people to do that um, without coming in? Uh, remote work um, not only protects people from coming and going from the campus, it also protects them if they're using uh, public transportation, but it requires having IT systems um, as well as personnel policies in place to support that. It also allows for people to continue their important work um, when, for example, K-12 education um, is canceled. I know many people are also working with online education um, to ensure students can have continuity of instruction. Um, and we've talked a little bit about really uh, aggressively and decisively moving through event cancellation, um, checking with where your local community is with event cancellation um, and being ready um, to uh, quickly cancel all of those. The final thing I'll mention, and this is where I think in particular, um, all of our organizations uh, can support. Um, here at University of Southern California, um, we have um, not had students um, on campus or we've been working to kind of um, move to a distance format for over a week now. Some campuses are ahead of us um, and we're all, already starting to try to understand how do we build community and how do we hold community um, when we are asking people uh, to be physically separate. Um, and I think this will be an area of really important um, work for all of our organizations. We know that uh, the fear and the disconnection um, is a real uh, danger right now. And so how do we use our existing structures to allow people to remain in community um, and get emotional and social support um, while they are not able to physically be connected? So I encourage all of you to um, take a look at the guidelines. Um, and then I think at this point, we're gonna open it back up to questions. Thank you, Sarah, for that valuable information. We'll now move forward with our question time. And so our first question kind of has a two-part piece, but is around students still being on campus. And so the first part of the question is, how does a small to medium-sized college handle students with respiratory disease regarding expected increased numbers of cases of flu, pneumonia, and COVID-19 along with high-risk aerosolization. 
um, knowing that most medium size to small size colleges don't have negative pressure rooms and many of them may have degrees decreased numbers of staff and inadequate facilities to accommodate these students. So I'm happy to take that question. I think there's multiple parts to it. So if your health service does not have what we call a surge plan, um, I think that's exactly what you're talking about. Um, so I'll share with you some of the best practices that are emerging in this issue area. I think the first thing is defining your capabilities um, and also defining the capabilities of your the other medical establishments within your area. We, you may not be able to provide this service. Um, and so I think it's important to um, define that and communicate that to partners. But that being said, I think it, it's very important that people have a plan to try to provide this to the degree possible. One of the best practices in this area that I would suggest people adopt is to move away from in-person respiratory visits. Um, we know that healthcare environments are um, high risk uh, for transmission of, of disease. We, so working um, very decisively to get a telemedicine option up. Now, telemedicine, there are lots of formal um, platforms on which to do telemedicine. You may have access to those, but you don't actually have to have a telehealth program to do telehealth. Um, you can do telehealth through phone calls. Uh, we know that there was just guidance from HHS to relax some of the standards about doing telehealth on Zoom. So really to say that uh, one part of the surge plan should be to bring all respiratory visits through a telephone screening. Uh, from there, you can triage into those people that can be provided with care uh, through um, home care, self-care instructions, and then really limiting the number of students that require in-person visits to those individuals for whom you think a in-person clinical assessment is needed. Um, if you have a testing capability as that comes online, that can then be, then be put into your workflow. Um, many uh, organizations, including ours, are using a tent outside to do testing in. Um, and you could also consider using a tent to do the clinical assessments in. Uh, that allows you to uh, not have to worry about the aerosolized uh, issues in terms of the room turnover. Um, you do need to make sure that your staff has access to appropriate personal protective equipment. Uh, but I think that you should, uh, I would, if you don't have a plan to do that, I would do that now. Um, but those are two best practices I would, I would recommend. Um, and I'll turn it to Jim, who uh, may also have some additional, I'm sure has additional thoughts from his perspective on that. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Um, I, I do think some of us, and I'll speak pretty much for myself, lose perspective because I, have the privilege of working in, in a uh, exceedingly well-resourced environment with an academic medical center on the, on the north side of my campus. Um, and so for those of you who are in smaller institutions where you very much feel um, isolated, I have huge admiration. And um, sadly, I do think there's many more questions and frustrations than there are answers. Having said that, um, I hope that there's opportunities to partner with um, with the local health department. I, in some jurisdictions, they probably are willing, but are completely unable right now because of, of um, uh, the, the volume of, of cases that they're trying to manage. But I, I also think it's really important that we not lower our standards of, of care. Um, we don't lower our standards of, of um, of protecting our staffs. Um, and ultimately, there's only so much um, that we can do. When, when, it, when it gets to the point of wondering whether you have a negative pressure room in your clinic, we've exceeded what college health probably is supposed to be in most places. 
um, and yet we have these students on our campus and how do we strike a balance? And certainly one of the ways is, as Sarah suggested, uh, um, non-traditional um, um, access such as in, uh, in an outdoor tent. But um, these are just extraordinarily challenging uh, questions and um, uh, I'll endorse everything that Sarah said and wish you well with how the smaller um, universities are able to uh, respond. Um, we'd love to get all of our students off campus. That would be a dream for a little while, but that's simply for, for grad students, It's this is their home. Uh, and we actually have many more grad students on our campus than we have undergrads. But even for a lot of our undergrads, uh, they can't go home for various reasons. So, you know, some of them because they home is in a country where they'll never be able to get back into the United States um, or because home is abusive or um, uh, all sorts of other uh, permutations. Uh, uh, but uh, very difficult question. Thank you. Dr. Jacobs, can you revisit um, what you shared about asymptomatic people and their ability to spread the disease if they are contagious or are not contagious? <clears throat> so asymptomatic, uh, pretty clear the meaning there is that I feel completely fine. I, I if someone asked me how I was feeling, I would say I am fine. I you know I have no symptoms. I don't have a little bit of a sore throat. I don't have a little bit of fever. I just feel fine. And so um, the question is, um, if I'm asymptomatic but am infected with uh, COVID-19, meaning that if a test is done, I'm testing positive for COVID-19, uh, the question is, can I still be spreading virus even though I'm not coughing and sneezing and um, and I'm doing a great job of washing my hands um, and so forth. And I think right now, and Sarah, please jump in, but my, I believe that where we're at right now is the answer is maybe. Maybe I'm infectious. Um, but the data, the data just are not um, compelling. But I, I also think that in the, in the context of a pandemic, we should all, just like we, we do with other infectious diseases such as HIV, well, that, it, it may be a little bit of a stretch here because it's of the, the paths of, of infectivity, but um, I should assume that I have COVID and I should assume that um, the people on the bus with me also have COVID. And I should be taking all the precautions, um, again, social distancing and hand washing and all the other things we talked about. Um, uh, because even, whether asymptomatic spread is virologically possible, I should assume that it is. Our next question is, how long do we expect the pandemic to last? That's got Sarah's name written all over it. Yeah, so um, what, a, what an interesting question. Um, so I think Early on in this webinar, Jim said, you know, this is a novel virus. Um, and I think that's one of the things that makes this uniquely challenging and hard. So we've had, you know, public health situations before, for example, you know, issues with Ebola or measles, uh, even influenza. And those are pathogens that we we know really well you know we we know all we know they may be more deadly they may be more frightening but we know everything about them one of the challenges with a novel emerging agent like this and causing pandemic is we don't understand um just as jim was mentioning we're not even sure how important asymptomatic transmission is so that's what is makes it hard uh, to plan. And when we look, there are people who've looked at various scenarios about what might happen. You've heard people talk about, well, maybe it'll get better when the weather gets warm. Maybe it'll go away and come back. Um, I think there are people for planning purposes who are doing that sort of planning scenarios. But I think that 
it really is at the level of scenario planning right now. It also depends on what we do. And by we, I'm not really necessarily talking at the campus level. I'm talking about the at the community, the state, the national, the global level, really. What we do um, to control it, how rapidly we take decisive action on social distancing, um, how seriously and effectively we're able to implement it. Um, we know that, you know, for example, in China, um, they have been able to really um, slow the spread. So I don't know the answer to that question. I think that for campuses, uh, I can share where we are. Our planning scenarios um, need to have windows that go at least several months. The next question is very similar. When will the outbreak get to a place where social distancing isn't required and we can have students back on campus? Uh, again, using Sarah's terminology of planning scenarios, uh, I think, and this is Jim speaking, this isn't ACHA speaking, this is Jim speaking. Uh, I think it's reasonable to plan on being able to resume semi-normal activities in the fall. I think it's not reasonable to expect normal summer activities. And uh, for a lot of campuses, it, I mean, we need to be working now to, de to make um, decisive decisions about whether the tennis camp and the lacrosse camp and the debate club and all the things that might come to you, our campuses during the summer are going to be allowed to do that. Um, uh, and even though I'm optimistic about um, the fall, so much could happen between now and then uh, that would ch change that optimism. Um, or maybe in a best case scenario, uh, our plan is the first week of campus, we're doing mass vaccination clinics because somehow a vaccine has been developed. It's very unlikely that it'll be ready by, by fall, but um, there's some optimism on some fronts in that regard. Um, so again, using uh, planning scenarios, there probably should be a planning scenario that you might be able to, depending on what part of the country you're in, you might be able to do some things um, during the summer. Um, another scenario is just to resume activities in the fall. And there's probably a worst case scenario that looks at January um, or even um, the following summer. Thank you. Our next question is, how can you tell the difference from a cold, flu, and COVID-19, especially when there are mild cases that do not even allow for testing? Do we isolate it as if it's COVID-19 in areas of community spread? So this is a challenging question, um, and um, I think that this will evolve as we have increased access to testing. So certainly there are um, clinical, um, there are you know some clinical um, signs and symptoms uh, that are um, emerging that you know are you know that our kind of patients with this have. What we know from that, though, is that there is a range of symptoms um, from mild respiratory, upper, what we call upper respiratory symptoms, to the more severe lower respiratory symptoms. And there is not clear clinical symptom uh, kind of, there's not a clear clinical set of things that help us accurately distinguish. Certainly, if we know somebody has a positive test, so for example, a positive flu test, um, there is good evidence that it's unlikely for people to be co-infected. So if we can identify another respiratory pathogen, um, and the one that we have might have commonly available is influenza, then it's likely they do not have COVID-19. Um, but this is why the other guidance, especially as we have more and more community spread without widespread availability of testing, this is why we really need to be stressing to people that um, everybody needs to stay home when they're sick. 
um, and assume that, I mean, I'm not in terms of 14 day isolation, but assume uh, that, 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 that moving forward, that that could be a COVID-19 infection. So everybody staying home when they're coughing, seizing, they have the flu. If testing becomes more widely available, um, that will be really helpful with that. But right now, um, especially in areas where there's community transmission, um, people with upper respiratory, lower respiratory symptoms um, need to take precautions to prevent the spread. Jim, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Um, just a, a little bit of a nuance, because uh, in a lot of parts of the country, we're also in allergy season. Um, and so if the symptoms of you know runny nose and watery eyes feels the same as your allergy symptoms have felt for the last five years, I think you can feel a little bit of reassurance. Um, but if that doesn't usually come with a sore throat or it doesn't usually come with a little bit of a dry cough, then back to what Sarah said. Um, and even the guidance that that I just gave of does this feel the same as your usual allergies, that, that's not an exact science. Um, but I'm also fearful of having every single member of our community in 14 days of isolation, which we just can't tolerate that either. So it's, it's these, uh, the, the, the audience is asking the most difficult of the questions that uh, our, our campuses are facing. So it's, it's right on, right on point. Thank you. I don't know if this next question falls in that same vein that you just shared in the difficult question. Um, but can you explain what is expected to happen after we finish social distancing for six to eight weeks? Are we delaying the experience until later when there's a different climate with more knowledge about treatment? And what is happening right now in China now that they've started lifting the bans that are existing? Um, well, I'll I'll answer part of this, uh, or at least attempt to, and then Sarah, please um, uh, follow up. Um, so it is not realistic to think that we're going to get rid of COVID anytime soon. Um, now, we would love to see some seasonality. Um, but I, it's not clear to me yet whether that's all wishful thinking or whether there's enough data to support that. Um, but COVID-19 is likely to be a new normal for us um, for maybe forever, but it's gonna be a pathogen that we're gonna to have to learn how to deal with. And so even after we get past sort of the epidemic and pandemic phases, um, we're probably gonna to have to figure out how to incorporate this into our usual um, practice of, of medicine. Um, so that, that's why there's so much desire and importance uh, to uh, to find a vaccine because we'd be having the same conversation about measles if we didn't have an effective measles vaccine. So um, for the foreseeable future, I think we're going to continue to deal with with COVID. Uh, although it, we'd like for it to 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 not be spreading at pandemic rates. Um, but concern for vulnerable populations, whether based on age or or chronic illness, that concern is probably going to have to persist um, indefinitely until an effective vaccine is available. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, and what we've seen, and particularly if we look at what happened in the initial area of the outbreak as, as well in Italy, um, you know, what we've you know, we've heard this idea. Some people have said, well, everybody's going to get it anyway. Why don't we let people get it? Um, and th this gets back to the slide that Jim showed in the beginning is that um, we have pretty good evidence, at least in a couple areas, that when we allow that sort of initial transmission to happen um, without the attempt uh, to have or have without having been able to effectively try to contain it, we overwhelm our healthcare system to the point that we are not, we don't, we just don't have the capacity to take care of people with the severe cases. So by delaying that and, and, and mitigating to the degree possible that widespread um, transmission through our community, 
uh, we better position our healthcare systems to be able to cope with that percentage of people that have severe disease um, and require care. Um, and then it also allows us time to develop antiviral treatment and or hopefully at some point a vaccine. Um, so I think it's pretty clear that the idea that we just sort of let it spread and see what happens um, is, is pretty is very dangerous and will exceed our healthcare system's capacity to care for those individuals that are severely affected. Regarding the um, comments about telehealth, should all college students be sent home or to friends or families in order to procure care more readily and not put small staffs or healthcare providers in small health centers at risk? Can they only do triage and telehealth? So I think the idea of sending students home is a tricky one, right? Because we know that for many of our students, you know, you know, home is a, you know, our, our campus students may have family homes that they can return to. Many students may not have family homes. Um, and so we need to be really cautious that we are providing care for, uh, we're making sure that we're not otherwise interrupting other basic needs. That being said, we know that the congregate living situations uh, for many students are problematic in terms of permitting and supporting um, self-isolation and social distancing. So it is my recommendation right now that all colleges and universities, and it's complex, right, need to evaluate their ability to support social distancing in their student population, particularly from a residential standpoint, and where possible, if we can move those students to home, to other places, and I think in most cases that's a fam back to a family home where social distancing and self-isolation is much more able to be supported, um, that that is the play way they need to be do either doing it or have plans in place to do it quickly. So that really is the, I think, the reason to do this. That analysis, though, it, it's complicated, right? So it has to do with who are your students, where is home, um, where are the options, how are how do they live congregately, what is, as we discussed earlier, what is the capacity of your on-campus student health services to support um, kind of ongoing clinical care, and that's a very local decision. But I think it is it is true that it is very, very difficult to man, going to be difficult to manage this with when you have long, large numbers of students uh, living in um, the typical congregate living situations that our students live in. And if you can get them sort of relocated um, before the majority of students relocated before you have a significant amount of transmission in your community, um, that will be really helpful. As far as whether you should be providing just telehealth, again, I think that's a local. Um, that's a local decision. Um, it depends on how big your health service is, what your capacity is. Do you have the capacity to uh, properly care for people um, with potential infections? Um, again, that is really dependent. I think the advantage of telehealth, though, is something that if it is something you can support, um, one, it, it, it's a much safer way to provide care for respiratory symptoms by having that initial screen. And two, um, it's a way to allow your student health service team um, to continue to care for students um, within your state, um, based on where we are now, um, and actually reduce the burden on other parts of the healthcare system um, that might be overtaxed. Um, so I think exploring that and thinking about uh, how you can offer it or, or start to offer it, even when your students disperse, recognizing the state licensing requirements, is a great way that we in College Health can contribute to the, the, the kind of healthcare-wide system response to caring for people. But I'd also like to balance that with the, the, the stark reality that for many of our students, we, again, it's focusing very narrowly on student health, we are their doctor. 
um, they've paid a health fee or whatever the setup, the setup is at, at our individual campuses. But for us to say, we're, you know, for the next four weeks, we're no longer uh, doing um, abdominal pain visits or uh, migraine visits, or we could pick hundreds of different diagnoses. Um, I find that really problematic. And not that we've solved it necessarily on my campus, but uh, even though we want lots of students to be away, the fact is we still have students on campus and um, we have to somehow balance um, all the safety um, concerns for, for students and our staffs with the reality that we are their doctor and we, we've got to be able to provide um, some uh, baseline um, level of service. At this point, completely, and and our, and 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 we have, and since if we're able to safely, you know, we we really um, we can really help, um, you know, uh, continue to provide care um, in in what will be an overtaxed healthcare system. Right. At this point, do we have any data about whether recovering from initial infection results in immunity? Uh, I'm aware of data that, that uh, is showing that antibodies, actually protective antibodies, um, do um, result. But the question is, how long do they last and how protective are they? Um, but they're protective, at least in the short term, to the extent that there are protocols, as there are for other diseases, there are protocols for, for isolating the antibodies from previously infected persons um, and actually using them as a in in the treatment of newly infected persons. So that's a little bit of optimism about um, the ability of infected persons to, to develop immunity. But again, this is a disease that we didn't even know the existence of until late December. And so we absolutely cannot say anything that yes, five years later, there's still protective antibodies or uh, even five months later. Uh, so, so there's a little glimmer of good news there, but uh, still lots unknown about protective antibodies. Also, I guess I'll, I'll throw into that. Uh, I don't think we know if, if you have an asymptomatic infection, whether your body mounts enough of a antibody response uh, to be protective. Uh, again, just one, one of many of the unknowns. All right, um, so we would really like to thank everyone today. We tried to get to as many questions as possible. Um, and as a reminder, we will have the recording available tomorrow on the ACHA website for everyone. And thank you everyone for joining today's webinar as well.